I haven't seen anyone else talking about it, to be honest, Dave. Because they're looking at, you know, it, they're, they're watching what the Fed wants them to watch. They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Hi there, my name is Shane Moran, and I'll be your host for this episode of Live from the Vault, and welcome to the show that goes beyond the headlines and uncovers the truth about the precious metals industry and the effects on the global economy in these historic times. With exclusive access to experts and insiders, we reveal information and insights that you simply won't find anywhere else. Now, this week we have the one and only Andrew McGuire, precious metals expert and whistleblower in the vault. And to help him pull back the curtain, we'll be joined by a returning guest and by popular demand by you, the Life in the Vault community, precious metals expert, Dave Kranzler. That's right, Dave Kranzler is in the vault and you're not going to want to miss a word of this conversation. Now, just before we head over and introduce our featured guests and head over to the UK, uh, please help us Keep spreading the word about this channel by hitting that like button and sharing this information and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. And if you click on that bell right now, right there, you see that bell? We will notify you as each episode goes live. Now, if you haven't already met Dave Kranzler, well, he's a hedge fund manager, precious metals analyst, and an author of the bi-weekly subscription newsletter called the, the Mining Stock Journal. Now, we'll be adding a link right there below if you want more information on that. And after years of trading expertise built up on Wall Street, Dave now co-manages a Denver-based precious metals mining stock investment fund and helps people understand the truth about the financial system and the economy. And Dave's also been featured in Arcadia Economics, Palisade Gold Radio, and SF Live, giving his take on the precious metals, future, path, and the Fed and macroeconomic environment at large. And with that, let's head over to the UK and Talking Gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire and our featured guest, Dave Kranzler. Over to you, Andy. Well, thanks. Thanks, Shane, for the intro. Um, Dave is, of course, <laughs> one of our favorite friends that uh, comes and joins us every now and again. And, and to be honest, not not often enough. We have so many um, requests for you, Dave. Um, thank you so so much for, um, for for coming and joining us today and talking about all the stuff that we freewheel and talk about. Thanks for having me on again. It's always a pleasure to do your show. Yeah, well, look, you know, obviously, you know, our our, our centers are of a gold, silver, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but um, but Dave, what the hell is going on? Your side of the pond. I mean, it looks scary to me. The the economy looks like it looks like the Fed's boxed itself in uh, to cutting rates and 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 Lord. And then I've just literally uh, we've now got evidence that um, that there's going to be an avalanche of dollar selling as soon as the Fed cuts rate. Then then um, that we've got um, some Bloomberg really reliable Bloomberg information. That uh, we're probably going to see at least a trillion of uh, dollars of avalanche, as they as they put it, an avalanche of dollar selling, um, based on simply the fact is is when the Fed cuts rates, you don't want to be in those dollars. No, and I I, I think what that where that's coming from is, and, and I've said this all along. I mean, our, if you remember, we had that the carry trade uh, sell off. A few weeks ago, through what about a month ago, I guess. Yeah. And and you know some of the optimistic Wall Street banks de declared that the carry trade was done. Well, yeah, it's done at the current spread between the yen and the dollar. But once if they cut rates, which they probably will, and particularly if they do fifty basis points, you're going to unleash another torrent of carry trade unwind. I mean, no one knows for sure how big the carry trade is. I've seen. 21 trillion thrown out there, but you know, who really knows? So, and, and so I think that's, that's probably where the, the source of the dollar selling would come from. Interesting. So, so, I mean, obviously you've got um, an election coming up. Um, you've got the fed kind of boxed in. Um, I mean, good God. I mean, I don't know about you. I don't like to make predictions 
Um, but if there was ever going to be a non-farm payrolls politically sort, non-farm payrolls beat, even though they've revised everything down and, and cleared the, the decks, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me to see some stel- ridiculous stellar number. What, what's your thoughts? <laughs> I, you know, I, I've stopped having an opinion of where the number is going to come in a long time ago because it's so manipulated and massaged. I mean, they can yeah. they can make it whatever they want it to be for political purposes. So, but and if they do want to juice the numbers to to support the the incumbent political party in the White House, they got to be careful. They got to walk a fine line, right? Because if they juice it too much, the Fed won't be able to cut rates. Certainly not 50 basis points, which is what the market's pricing in right now. So, and, and I mean, there's no, if they did have a, a robust jobs number, there's no way they'd be able to back it up with actual evidence. I mean, to be honest, because I also have the short sellers journal in addition to my mining stock journal, and, and I scour the economic data every week so that I can go over it in my newsletter. And not so much the government reports, but the private sector reports and, and the, the, you know, the, the um, industry association type reports, they're showing an economy that especially manuf- manufacturing has been in a recession for over two years now. I mean, the Dallas, the Dallas Fed manufacturing index has been negative for something like 20, 23 months in a row or something like that. And, and all the regional Fed economic reports, for the most part, are, are um, showing contraction in business activity in the various regions. But what's even worse, and the Fed knows all this, they know all this, that what, what's worse is that, and we saw it yesterday in the, um, in the ISM PMI uh, data that was released, not only is, is manufacturing contracting, but wages and input prices are rising again. So th- there's that factor too. And the Fed knows that. I mean, if they cut rates, I have a theory on that. I, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think they'd be cutting rates to try and, and jump, jumpstart the economy because 50 base point. I, I think you could take rates back to zero and you're not going to jumpstart the economy. It's too broken right now. It's too structurally broken and there's too much debt. I think they'd be cutting rates to help the banks out because I think there's 2008 like problems fomenting behind the curtain, behind the Fed's curtain in the banking system. And that to me, that's why Warren Buffett has been dumping Bank of his Bank of America shares. I don't know if he's finished selling or if he's out. And he also liquidated his U.S. bank position. So he's he's basically washing his hands of being invested in banks. Wow, Dave. I mean, that's, you know, you've got to follow those big footprints. Yeah. So obviously, you know, they're not, these guys are not shy of taking risk. So clearly that is an issue. I didn't, I didn't realize that. I haven't been tracking that myself. Now you, you, you'd mentioned just now you, you run a short seller's journal. That's really interesting because there's very few people that actually are, to be honest, skilled enough to, to be able to, um, discern um, and and you know I know you've done this for years and years and years now I know we talked about it last time I'm pretty mind blown um, that you've made some excellent calls on that um, so so what what do you I mean you've mentioned some of what you're seeing here but I mean the banking's you've just mentioned the banking sector um, there's there's still a, the CRE footprint uh, uh, foot, you know. Uh, fallout is that still looking like it might come or i mean it's happened it's, it doesn't get reported anymore i think the media has been told to shut up about it but i mean it just it gets worse every day um there was a, a report out i don't know within the last couple of weeks just to use denver which i live near denver as an example the the vacancy rate in office buildings in downtown denver is is like close to 40 percent and, and Denver's not unique in that regard. And you're, you're seeing, you know, pension funds over the course of the last nine to 12 months that were inve- that had bought buildings are selling them for like a dollar just to just to get the debt off off, you know, just to get it out from under the debt that's connected to the buildings. So um, and, and I mean, the commercial real estate, the, the debt itself is, is melting down 
And I, I think that's part of what's troubling the Fed. But we have no idea the extent to which there's over-the-counter derivatives that are connected to the debt. I mean, there's no reason to think that there isn't a lot because, you know, now that I just read an article, I think I think it came out yesterday or Monday, maybe. The the banks now collectively, the big banks hold more OTC derivatives now than they did in 2008 when the derivatives blew up. So, I mean, and, and CREs, that, that's only part of the problem. I mean, you've got, you've got consumer debt is, is starting to go distressed, especially, you know, anything that's rated below subprime, I mean, below prime. And even, even the prime debt, the, you know, for auto debt and credit card debt defaults are rising pretty quickly. Um, and you've got, and this is another thing that doesn't get reported on a lot. It, it it did for a while, but if you recall, we went through a bubble phase where private equity firms were doing, you know, they called them, you know, going private transactions or whatever they call them. You know, back in the eighties, they would have been called leverage buyouts mm. where you use a lot of debt and a little bit of equity and you buy out companies. And that's what they were doing. And the banks, especially as toward the end of, of before the bubble kind of burst, the banks started having trouble syndicating the debt they were underwriting. So the banks have been, especially JP Morgan, they've been left holding a lot of this, this leveraged debt, leveraged transaction debt, and it's go, it's going distressed also. And so, and again, you know, that's the type of thing where they'll, they'll underwrite the debt, you know, hedge funds will buy it and then they'll, structure OTC derivatives around the debt. So there, there's that aspect too. And so I, at some point, and I don't know when, and, you know, I, and I, maybe the Fed figured out how to, how to liquefy it before it actually happens again. But at some point, I think you're going to see massive counterparty default defaults going on. And, and that's basically what happened in 2008. I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and probably a best estimate it's got to be uh, the derivative, the total derivative exposure. And it's all one daisy chain. I mean, we get yep. one derivative fallout, then the counterparty risk to another and another. It's, the whole thing falls apart. I mean, two quadrillion wouldn't be an outrageous assumption. I, I mean, I, 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 you don't really even see the numbers reported like you used to back then. I mean, mm. part of it is, is because... Um, they changed the accounting, <laughs> and and uh, so what they did is is they made it easier for banks to hide this stuff off their balance sheet, and they allowed them to use netting. So the banks can say, "Oh, well, yeah, we're we're long this OTC derivative, this credit default swap, but we have you know counterparties that offset it over here." And so and they net that out. And so you know even if if you know any specific banks sitting on a trillion dollars worth of notional derivatives, it, it, it shows up in the footnotes netted out to, to, to being not very significant. And of course, the key assumption there is, is that all counterparties are sound, which you can't make that assumption. Oh, that brings us right back to, to gold because, I mean, you only have to pull up a, a COT report, for example. And, and then when you realize, and we all know, that is just the COMEX side of the situation now. So how can, so obviously after after the, the, the bailouts and one thing and another, the CFTC, um, the CME reports to the CFTC. Now they then, um, they say, well, look, you see this big short position we have in, in gold or silver, but let's just talk about gold at the moment because open interest went up and everyone was pulling their hair out at this huge accumulation of um, of short interest. But the way they get away with that is exactly what you're just describing. You take an over-the-counter position, which is actually Basel III compliant, NSFR compliant, meaning that, that an over-the-counter FX gold position is physically deliverable. Therefore, it's a first-year asset class. So now you're using this first-year asset class to hedge a futures contract. However, it's not one-to-one. -one. It's an asymmetric trade. And, and this is it. How the degree of leverage used to be phenomenal. It used to just be unlimited. I can print as much money as I want. Therefore, I'll push it as far as I want and I'll just wipe everyone out. But, but 
the thing is, and, and this is the interesting part about gold, is that they only, it's only asymmetric to the degree that they dare, they can find enough CTAs, speculators, to cover their positions off, but they keep getting it wrong. And therefore, you, you kind of wonder why each time we see another higher, higher, higher stair step, because the game's changed. And I think ever since Basel III NSFR standards came into play, um, as far as the, as far as as far as the um, uh, the CFTC is concerned, you're covered. What they don't know is the degree of leverage between one because one's over the counter and unreportable, even though it has to be deliverable. On the other side of that trade is the COMEX trade, where the short positions are supposed to be hedged one to one, but they're not. So it's, what you're talking about is probably very similar to what we're seeing there. I mean, what irritates me with this is that the CFTC doesn't hold the COMEX banks accountable for the numbers they report. I mean, the banks come, the, the numbers that everyone like, scrutinizes, you know, the daily open interest report and then the weekly commitment of traders report, the banks originate that data. It doesn't get audited. I mean, they can, you know, just like the government can make GDP or CPI or employment number, whatever it wants it to be, those those banks can make those numbers, whatever they, they want the market to believe that they are. Now, I do think there's there's a for the most part, I think the numbers are legitimate, but I don't I wouldn't trust them 100 percent. And they, you know, they have every motive for for fudging the numbers. And I, you probably remember this, but on the um, the warehouse stock report that for the gold and, and silver inventories at, at, at the, in the Comex vaults around 2012, I think a disclaimer showed up on the bottom of the spreadsheet where it to, just to paraphrase it, it's like, um, you know, these numbers aren't audited, and you know, trust them at your own risk. That I mean, that's kind of a an exaggerated paraphrase of it but that's basically the gist of what it said so it, it basically said hey these are the numbers we're showing you we're not going to guarantee that they're they're factual <laughs> mind-boggling i mean how how, how who the hell can get away with that i mean it's just unbelievable well it shows you who's who's in really who's in charge of this of the system right yeah and ultimately the political system the banks I think the big problem is is that um, the over-the-counter, a bilaterally settled over-the-counter tra trade has no um, uh, regulation. Other than the fact is, yes, the BIS can, can say that if I now take a short position on a, a spot, I'm not, I'm not doing that, but if I was to take a short position uh, or a long position in the over-the-counter markets, I better make sure that if I'm called for delivery, that I am able to deliver it because it is NSFR compliant. It's a first year asset class now. So, so, so basically, it's while that is true, there is no regulation as to exactly these bilateral set, bilaterally settled trades. As I and, I, and you know, I met with um, uh, the Bank of England governor. Andrew Bailey, when he was the head of the FCA, and that's exactly what he said. But but there's no way of knowing what they are. So as you say, the fudge content here is unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's all done intentionally. I mean, th these the banks intentionally are you know blowing smoke around what they're doing in the gold market, particularly the Fed. I mean, I think, you know, you, you've you studied the arguments and seen seen the information and the analysis probably for longer than I have. It, it's not even, no one's even sure if the Fed still ha possesses physically legal title to the gold that it holds on behalf of the U.S. Treasury. And any, when if you remember when Ron Paul, he was, he was pretty, he was a bulldog about trying to, to pass legislation that would require a, an independent third party audit of the Fed, which hasn't been done since Eisenhower was in office. And, and Barney Frank, who was the um, chairman of the of the House 
Banking and Finance Committee or whatever they called it um, or call it now, um, he would block that bill from getting out of committee every time it came up, every single time. And the Fed spent millions in Congress lobbying against it. In fact, they they had hired, um, I can't remember, I know, remember her first name was Linda. I just don't remember her last name, Linda Robinson or something like that. And she was she was the head lobbyist for Enron. <laughs> So, I mean, it just, it tells you the, these guys, these guys know that they're, you know, there's issues with, you know, what's going on with, with the gold that's, you know, being held by the Fed and they don't want anyone to know about it. I mean, it's ludicrous. And they, they also, they rebuff every Freedom of Information Act because they're not, they're not held accountable by the Freedom of Information Act. So, you know, the only way you're going to get them to, um, open their kimono on what's going on with gold is to, is to get a federal judge to compel them. And that's not, that's never going to happen. And Dave, that's why we're seeing repatriations. Yes. One after the next to the next. And exactly. Great point. No one trusts, no one trusts those numbers. I mean, when you think about it, any, if, 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 look, if you held your gold in a private vault and, and, and they, and you said, oh, I just want to come and um, just check on it. And they said, "No, you're not allowed in." Oh, the Germans! What What would you do? I mean, you would you would uh, you'd send well, you'd send the police in for a start off. You, you would you'd say, oh, "I think this is theft going on here." They won't allow me to even. You send your auditor in, and then he'd be refused. And then that would be the procedure. And then you call the police. And that's what Harvey Organ did in 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 uh, Scotia Macotta when he went to look at his gold and silver, and it would it just wasn't there. It just wasn't there. It was somewhere in Asia or it had been sort of lent out. And and, and because he called the RCMP, literally, and, and he'll tell you that story. I, I mean, and we, he t- told us, he, he, in fact, we had him on, the, on, on a live from the vault and he told us the story. It was mind boggling that the, the brazen, the brazenness of it. Um, crazy, crazy stuff. I, I, and so, yeah, so now you've got the, the Fed. The, the only, the, I believe, the only central, global central bank still fighting the price of gold. Obviously, I, to me, I guess because it, it competes with the dollar and they're trying to maintain the unipolar dollar, um, I, I guess that's, that otherwise they would have capitulated and, and seen the writing on the wall. I mean, this is... Ludicrous because every other central bank is long gold. Every first year bank I speak to, every every trading bank I speak to, whether it's Goldman Sachs, JP, or any of them, they're all long for their own book. Yes, they act as agent for the Fed, but it's on the Fed's book. So, as you say, you know this cannot end well. Well, it, it's starting to not end well now. I mean, look, you know, look at the action that we've seen in gold and. I mean, I'd say for at least the last six months, every effort that's been made to try and, you know, create one of those shock and awe sell offs that turns into a two or three month decline in in gold and silver. I mean, it gets stopped quickly. I mean, look at the latest one. I mean, gold, gold's tested, you know, 2,500 twice now this week, yesterday and today, and bounced off it both times. And they, when they tried to get silver below 27 and and keep it below 28, I want to say about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, I forget. Because I I remember I saw the, the, um, at the time, I think it was the September silver future, and it dropped down below 27. And I immediately I put in an order for a bunch of silver eagles. (laughs) <laughs> did you get them oh yeah yeah and and you know actually that's with with the the premium i had to pay that's by far the most i've ever paid for silver but that's how convicted i am that silver is going to go a lot higher that's interesting are you what kind of premium were you looking at at the time because obviously when you've smacked it down that low well the coin dealers you know they they, they set their premium according to what the market will bear mm. and I'm trying to remember. I think it was maybe six bucks over, roughly at the time. No, it was seven. It was seven. So, you know, all in, I paid 30, 33 and change per ounce. 
<laughs> which, I mean, I had to hold my nose to do it because most of the silver that I've accumulated has been done under 10 bucks an ounce. <laughs> Good God. When you think about it, if that had been the Comex trade, seven bucks above the price, 5,000 5, ounces <laughs> per contract. I mean, you're talking a hell of a lot of silver there. <laughs> I, I mean, we might start to see that eventually. Well, the only, I, I, I know for certain that, that for certain, there's no point in doing it with gold, uh, no, no point in EFP in gold, um, because um, you can already take the FX position in London. You don't have to ship anything over. You don't have any costs there. So basically, you can just take the FX price, lock it in, uh, and demand T plus one delivery, and you get your gold. Silver, not so, because if you were to EFP silver into London, well, it, it become, it's still an unallocated position, unlike gold. So therefore, uh, they'll just play the usual games. It goes into the cartel's hands. They play games with it. And um, no one ever gets any delivery. Um, but the back door of the COMEX is, is where the focus is. And I know for certain that we have Indian buyers regularly turning up at the back door to get COMEX silver because it has to be delivered. As much as they kick and scream and try and talk, talk you out of taking delivery, it is legitimately the only way to get actually silver right now below what well, it's above 28 bucks spot right now but i mean but to to actually get a silver futures contract um at the at the price plus the tiny bit of friction is the only way is to get it is to go there and literally take delivery of it wow it tells you how tight the silver market's getting that's how tight it is yeah and of course and we know that um india is rabid buyer of silver. This is why it's so ludicrous. When you when you see silver like pop down below 28 bucks spot today and the day and the day before. I mean it is ludicrous. It is actually beyond credible because from a physical market perspective we know that there's very strong buyers um in from from India and we know that uh that citizens in uh, China are being incentivized to actually buy silver. Uh, and that could be for reasons of potential war. I don't know. Actually, um, China, well, both India and China have have um, government programs to, they're, they're both building national solar grids. And that, that's consuming a lot of silver. And I mean, India, you know, you, you can get, you know, the numbers on, on how much gold and silver that the, it imports. But China doesn't, I mean, and actually, same with China. The only import numbers that you see that are official is the gold that flows through Hong Kong. But in 2014, they opened up Beijing and Shanghai as, as ports of gold importation and intentionally do not make those numbers official. So no one really knows for sure how much gold is going in. They don't even report how much silver is imported. And there's there's one I saw a, a, an article on this it was fascinating. There was there's um, an industrial, um, you know, an industrial data report, you know, or it's a report that shows like in, industrial materials imported into the country. And there's a there's like a um, uh, there's a category where they they buy where they they're importing silver concentrate and but that's the only silver that you, that gets reported as being imported in the country i mean they i know that they're buying every ounce of silver the, the the pboc and the government's buying every ounce of silver for this program that they can get their hands on that's produced internally um i one of the companies i follow and recommend and i think it's i think it's really cheap Silver Corp. And I was talking with the CEO a few months ago. Um, and so they, I think for, for this year, for this fiscal year, they're going to produce 7 million ounces. And he's, he's, I asked him and he said, they sell every ounce they produce internally to, to Chinese customers. So it circumvents the entire silver cartel Altogether, 
Well, I mean, they're subjected to it <laughs> to the extent that they have to import silver, you know, for their program. But nevertheless, they can't get their sticky hands on it, right? And and play and and cap it because um, if I go and buy um, spot silver, um, then I have to pay a, a big premium uh, to get it, right? And and if it's too large a size, I get blacklisted. <laughs> And they can tell you, they can tell, because you can, I, we, so we went to Kyrgyzstan. This was a couple of years back. We tried it and they were warned, warned to, uh, to, to back off uh, Kyrgyzstan. And then basically um, we thought, okay, well, we've got a big order here. So we ordered it. Um, and then because JP Morgan, oh no, it was, uh, it was which, no, which bank was it? It was um, one of the Indian banks actually. Um, have have the run the books for them. So in other words, provide banking services for them. So as soon as we placed the order, a red flag popped up. Who is this buying silver? You're kidding. And, and it was a meet then then I think it was UBS that ultimately said to us, it led all the way to UBS and said, you back off. And 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 it was in fact we were getting, I think it was um one of the it was Swiss banks and Julius Baer. Uh, would be blacklisted if they proceeded to fulfill this. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, so that game has not changed. So anything that bypasses these guys, they can't get their sticky little fingers on it, is a very good thing. Yeah, no question about it. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're captive to them as, as, as retail buyers. Yeah, and, and also as, as, as a wholesale buyer. Um, then mm. obviously you, you need to be very well connected. But as you say, you have to get creative. I think, what was it? I think it was Robert Keynes. I think it was telling me how, I think I didn't know about it before he'd mentioned it, but apparently, uh, for example, not, not your favorite company, Tesla. <laughs> I know, but, um, but basically they were going to Mexico directly um, to buy from the mines uh, because really to avoid all the friction. And they cannot be the only ones. And I'm sure there must be, I'm sure a lot of people who are probably listening to this say, oh, yeah, we know of other other people doing exactly the same thing. I don't know. Have you heard of any? I've seen reports intermittently about that. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, because you can't rely on the, you can't trust uh, the conduit, the, 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 the tap that you turn and turn on. I mean, it should be a straightforward thing, you know, a buyer, a seller, a price. But <laughs> it's... It's a pretty straightforward, simple sort of. So, and, and it's, why would it matter if I want ten tons, a hundred tons, a thousand? What, it, what does it matter? It just means the price will reflect the order. Yeah. You know? So, essentially, that then affects all orders because now you've probably got perhaps you if you could put a too big an order and you're getting a bid only market probably, but you but there will always be a seller. This is the point. There's always a seller at a fair price, but it is so suppressed. And when you look at the charts and you see the ludicrous selling of paper silver down below 28 bucks today, and I'm pretty sure it bounced. I saw it bounce back up again because it also timed with the AM fixing gold, where suddenly all these guys come in and they're not just buying gold, they're buying silver too. Yeah. What a joke, Dave. It, it, it's become laughable and just too obvious not to be gamed. A lot of people still don't believe that gold and silver are manipulated, <laughs> even though, you know, there's every motive for banks and central banks to manipulate it. And as you pointed out, it's it's probably really only the Fed now that's fighting, fighting the prices. <clears throat> but that's, you know, that's what drives when you look at like I, I look at a 15 minute chart that goes overnight all day long. And when, and, you know, when you see those, those fishing line sell-offs, you know, that's, that's triggered by the banks because they know where the hedge funds and the CTAs have their sell stop set because the banks run the, the COMEX computers and the settlement systems. So, you know, they, they know the key price points where if they can dump enough paper on the market and trigger the stop, it'll, it'll trigger, an avalanche of paper selling from the hedge funds and CTAs. And that's what causes those, those sharp sell-offs. Absolutely. But as you quite rightly say, limited only really to um, those that they can rinse out. Yeah. Because 
They're not going to expose themselves to a T plus one delivery obligation. They can't short cover um, their position into on on the COMEX. Um, so yeah, so so that's why we don't have those. You're referring to those major falls that would go hundreds of dollars. Um, I mean, so those those are those have gone uh, simply because there's the physical buyers have come in and it's being settled. And silver and gold are being settled increasingly, of course, in the physical markets away from mm. this paper, these paper Western facing exchanges. Yeah, I mean, and that's you know, to me, that's been the key. That's that's kind of put um, an iron floor underneath the prices. Is that if they push it down too far, it ignites ferocious buying from China and India. And the other thing that we see um, is, uh, and and there's some good empirical evidence of this, and some footprints, some proper footprints as well, is the um, is the monetary gold, the unreported monetary gold purchases of largely 400 ounce uh, 995 bars, which never get put into a kilo bar form of, and they literally fly out of the UK, fly out of Switzerland, and literally land in China. Uh, these are monetary gold purchases that don't need to be reported. And, and it's become so large. Uh, and I think this is one of the reasons why I think uh, China has accumulated so much more gold than they officially talk about. Well, obviously, you know, we're not the only ones that think they, they've got um, significantly higher uh, 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 stocks. But what was interesting to me is last week, you had um, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan parachute himself into China and by all accounts, he looked like he'd been <laughs> tasered. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, really, they're, they're, he, you know, when you go in there with a carrot and stick approach to China, who really is the largest global tr trading house, uh, that's it, period, period, end of, and... Their, in, their, their dollar denominated trade with uh, uh, the US is shrinking rapidly. You don't go in there as with your unipolar bloody carrot and stick and start waving, warning them about you, putting money into Ukraine and uh, assisting in Ukraine and warning them about. Um, and, and when it was China that turned around and warned them about, don't you mess with Taiwan and arm it, you know, uh, sanctions. You really want to do this? Um, you know, we, we, we've got an awful lot of things we can do that would upset your dollar. And obviously, they're, they're not going to be stupid enough to dump U.S. Treasuries openly. But they've got three three point two five trillion of shadow banking reserves, FX reserves, which are definitely being employed. <laughs> But it just goes to show you how how arrogant the U.S. politicians are. I, I mean, it's they, they still think the U.S. runs the world, which it doesn't. <laughs> well, I, I I guess Dave, I, I don't know where you stand with this, but I mean, bloody hell, uh, something's gone wrong big time. I mean, we've just you've mentioned so many of the things that have gone wrong. Um, the dollars being. Um, the de-dollarization efforts. We've got BRICS coming up in October. I mean, you know, there comes a point. You've got an election coming up. The risk, the risk of Trump uh, taking um, control and draining that that swamp. Uh, I mean, to me, my I start to worry. Do they re perhaps they want to start a nuclear war now? Um, because I don't know. I hope not. But I have my theories on that. But I don't want to sound like Nostradamus. <laughs> No, oh, tell me, please. I, I value your the algorithm in your head. I mean, it's just so obvious to me what the U.S. is doing in Ukraine. I mean, it's. I haven't even really seen them deny it lately that that they're conducting a proxy war yeah. with Russia. Yeah, and and you know, and now they're now they're giving Ukraine long range missiles and permission to launch them. I mean, come on. Um, the you know the one. The, the one big Frankenstein we haven't even mentioned is the U.S. federal debt. Yes. I mean, so 
that's that's been largely funded for the last little more than a year by the the Fed's been draining that reverse repo facility. It it got up to as high as two point three trillion, and I didn't I didn't look at it yesterday. When I looked at it last week, it was low three hundred billions. So two two trillion of that is drained out. Most of that has been money market funds, and they've been they've been funding the government spending deficit for the last year. So, you know what what happens when that when that reverse and, and the Fed the Fed could prevent that the money from draining out of that. They just have to pay more interest on it if they wanted to keep that liquidity out of the system. But that's that's basically what they're using it for. It's part of what I call their stealth QE. Mm. And and you know also and I. I I don't see this a lot on social media because everyone either looks at the year over year percentage change in the money supply or they they're, everyone's watching to see what the Fed's doing with interest rates. But it's one of those things where that's what the Fed wants you to watch. Don't watch what I'm doing with the money supply. But the M2 money supply has been rising since October 2023. And the monetary base, which is bank reserves and coin and currency in circulation, has been rising since March 2023. And and almost 100% of that increase has been the Fed pumping bank reserves or reserves into the banks. So that I mean that's that's basically printing money. Well, you did an excellent piece on that in on your um on, on your website um about the Fed's stealth QE. Um an excellent excellent I really would encourage you. people to land on that and have a, a read because I haven't seen anyone else talking about it, to be honest, Dave. Because they're looking at, you know, they're, they're watching what the Fed wants them to watch. Mm. Or they're looking at the, and I, actually, I think, because I just saw this chart posted the other day on social media, I think the, the year over year percentage change in M2 is, is finally gone positive. Mm. But you got to look at the, the monthly increase in M2, not the year over year percentage change. And it, it shows you that M2 has been rising since October. And that, to me, that's why I believe, and I don't think anyone who's really looked closely at the issue believes that the CPI is, is a bona fide inflation rate. I know it's, it's not for me on the, the stuff that I spend money on every week. You know, the inflation rate's much higher. But I, I think that's why the Fed has had trouble containing inflation, real inflation. And I also think it's why the price of gold, part of the reason not hundred percent, but part of the reason why the price of gold is rising the way it is relentlessly, because, you know, the gold market sees that the the actual liquidity levels of dollars inside the U.S. financial system has been rising now for <clears throat> over a year, year and a half. Well, I, th- I think one of the other things I saw is you said something, I think it was something, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you showed a picture of a shopping cart. And I think you m- indicated that was probably the most expensive set of wheels you could ever push around. Yeah, I, I forget where I scraped that from, but it was I posted it on my blog. I thought it was funny. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it's the funny kind of thing that gets your attention. It, it was some dude who goes by Pablo Cruz on, on Twitter. <laughs> it was excellent. It was excellent. I was thinking, you know what? That's so true because I think um, – it, it, probably food inflation must be 19, 20%. Has to be. And for some things, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I buy regularly buy pretty much the same basket of goods when I go. And I mean, it seems like I pay more and more every time I go. And it's smaller. Or, or, or there's shrinkflation. Yeah. Correct. A bit of both, maybe even just to ease us in. Right. I mean, <laughs> So, so thinking about thinking about things um, shrinking or, or getting smaller, um, what you 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 obviously run this short sellers journal, which is really well respected. I know it is. Um, so, Thank you. what would you? Uh, and I know I think honestly, you do recommend that people land on your site and look at all. I mean, it's ridiculously cheap. Uh, to be honest, now I should be raise, raising the prices, but you should. I remember talking about this last time. I can't believe it. What, what do you charge? I can't. You, what is it you charge? It's for twenty bucks a month for either either newsletter. Well, to be honest, that that is that. that I mean, I'm sure you've got other uh, fund managers who just can't believe their luck 
um, and, you know, because they're gathering information. They, they probably pay you 10 times that, to be honest. There's probably some that don't subscribe because they they think the price reflects the quality. Well, that could be true as well. Um, but but is there anything, I mean, right now, obviously we're here today, um, there's gold, there's silver, there's stocks, um, and, and I think you really have been pointing one very, very early to say, I think this was even last year, we talked about the stock market bubble. Um, so... What, what's your thought? Is there anything that p- people can do uh, who are risk um, orientated, who don't mind taking a little extra risk um, into what looked like a bit of a sell off commencing? I, I mean, I, I, of course, I don't follow my own advice because I'm sitting in front of my trade station all day long every day. So, you know, I, I, I play the short side of the market using puts mm-hmm. and, you know, shorter term puts. So I don't have to pay premium. And if, if, if I'm wrong in the short term, I can sell them and roll them further out. And I talk about all the, this stuff in my newsletter. Um, but I think you just find some, some names that are extremely overvalued and short the shares and, and, you know, maybe put stop losses up 20%, you know, in case, somehow the fed does something that triggers a market melt up because that you know that's i mean just like going long you know you can never foresee something like what happened yesterday although i i actually thought it might happen um but you know eventually the fundamentals catch up to every company right i mean we've seen that over time and time again you know i just love to use enron as an example i could use tesla as an example I mean, Tesla was, I forget how high it got because it, it had that, that stock split, but uh, it's been as high as 400 and, and you know, it, it hit 400 in 2021 and it's, it's down 50% from that. So if you just shorted, Tesla somewhere in that vicinity, you know, anywhere over 350 and held it. I mean, you've, you've have a pretty nice rate of return and then you can do things like, uh, right. Puts against the short position to generate income, right? Cause, and if the, if the price goes below your strike, you're going to get the stock put to, and then you can just reshort the stock, but you've collected that premium. So, so um, I, I think you just got to find some ideas and, and be patient. It's a tough market to short because we know the Fed at some point is going to start overtly printing money. I mean, it, it's 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 generated this latest melt up in stocks that's happened really since October 2023, which coincidentally is when M2 started rising. So it's it's engineered this melt up in, in stocks and it, it's it's that makes it tough. and. Honestly, I, I think unless the Fed cuts 50 basis points, if they just cut 25 in September, I think I think the market will sell off. Yeah, because historically, the patterns are once the Fed starts cutting rates, the markets start to tank because and that that's what happened in, in 2008, mm. because what happens is the market all of a sudden says to itself, oh, no, the Fed's actually cutting rates. It must be a lot worse than we know. <laughs> So, it, you know, it's it's just like, you know, when they start hiking rates, they're way behind the inflation curve. When they start cutting rates, they're way behind the the economic curve and, and the inverted. You know, the mainstream media has tried to tell us nine ways to Sunday why the inverted yield curve is meaningless this time around. But that's not true. I mean, in the in the duration of time that it's been inverted. To me, that that reflects the severity of the economic depression that's coming at us. And I, you know, I've seen it, home builders are a good example. Now they they've they've run up on the expectation of rate cuts, and and the market is is so locked up with debt and unaffordability that it's it's basically it's basically hit a wall in this country in in most markets, especially the the hottest markets. And so I I don't even think. I think the Fed could take rates to zero and it might stimulate a small amount of activity in the housing sector. But most people, even, you know, even if, you know, 
mortgage rates go back to three and a half percent. They still, they can't afford the monthly cost of, of buying a home if they don't own one. And they can't afford the cost of moving up if they would, if they want to move up. And, you know, and it's, it's not just the cost of servicing the mortgage. It's everything involved, particularly homeowners insurance now and, and pro- property taxes are going up everywhere. So I, I think if you, you know, just find a, a handful of, of home builders and companies that are, you know, supply home builders and just sit on those shorts. You're going to make a lot of money over the next two years. And I, I, I actually talk about the housing market every week in my, in my newsletter. Cause it's, it's been a fascination to me since the 1990s when I was a junk bond trader on Wall Street. And one of the, you know, a lot of the home builders went bankrupt when after Drexel levered them up in the 80s. And then they started you know, reviving themselves and started issuing junk bonds again. And so I was trading the junk bonds on those. Really interesting. So you've got, and then of course, on the other side, you've got, I mean, who's going to buy? I mean, you talk about reducing interest rates or the Fed reducing interest rates, but if they're, if they're creating a trillion dollars of new debt every hundred days, who's going to buy those bonds unless the rate is higher? I mean, to me, it, it baffles me. That's that's why I think there's going to be issues when that reverse repo facility completely drains. And I mean, you know, there there might be issues in the next six to nine months because most of our large foreign financiers aren't aren't buying treasuries anymore. I think even Japan has stopped, which which is shocking to me. But um, that's that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. You know, how are they? And that's why I think at some point the Fed's going to have to start overtly printing money again, Yeah. because certainly cutting rates, although a lot of people think the, the long end will move move higher, in, you know, in rates, you know, because in theory, cutting rates just stimulates economic activity, which then re-stimulates inflation. So rates go up on the long end. I, I don't know. I mean, the, the market is just so. There's so much intervention, and it's 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 so not a, a free market that who knows what's going to happen when they start cutting rates. But you're right. I mean, that's that's another risk to their cutting rates. They make it even less attractive for foreigners to to buy treasuries unless they unless rates on the long end really move up. Because there's two factors there, right? You're getting paid less to hold U.S. monopoly paper. <laughs> And also the dollar selling off. So y- your position is, is worth, becomes worth less in your own currency, right? And you've got alternative. If you want to buy a first tier, park some money in a first tier asset class, well, gold has become a first tier asset class. So it competes right. with US treasuries. So, and that's what I think we are also seeing. And I think sometimes, while I don't trust, obviously, any of the COMEX data at all, but I do know of some CTAs who are using gold futures to as a sticky as a sticky hedge, and and literally as they're saying, well, we need to diversify into uh, other other first year hedge hedges, and gold is one of them. And so it never used to be there before, and there's more and more. I know I know of several. Who are saying, yeah, well, of course we're exposing ourselves to gold. And then you also see all them first year banks coming out and saying, yeah, gold 3000, why not? And, and, you know, this whole thing is not going to end well for the dollar, for the Fed, um, who is to me struggling like hell to just to treading so much, treading hard to maintain uh, a, a float. Yeah. I agree. That, that's there's something that's way worse than what happened in 2008 coming at us in the system. <laughs> well, I think we couldn't we couldn't end an episode without talking to you about one of the things I love about you about what you do is your mining um, stocks, uh, and you 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 look at the various sectors, juniors, uh, and every, well, every sector of gold. In fact. I have to shake it when I when 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 I see you again. I'm gonna I'm gonna buy you a massive beer because I remember <laughs> you you gave you just and you gave it away. Um, 
openly. He just said, yeah. So I said, I said, do you mind saying what, what, what do you think is worthwhile, you know, that, that you are liking at the moment? And you said Cabral Gold or Cabral Gold, is it? Cabral. Cabral. Yeah, Cabral. Well, I went in and bought it. I've got to shake your hand, man. That was, I mean, that was like, I couldn't believe it. It's, it is just going from strength to strength to strength. Uh, what a good call. I mean, if that's, oh, that's just one of your calls. I, I hope you didn't sell Cabral because no. I think over the next two or three years, it's a 10 bagger. No, not at all. I mean, what's, what's great about, and it's what attracted me to the, to the junior project development sector of the market when I first jumped in in 2001 is that most people don't look at them because a, most people don't look at mining stocks. And if they do, if they do want to, look at mining stocks, they look at the larger cap names, Newmont, Barrick, Agnico, Eagle. And so these things are largely ignored, except for, you know, a, a, a small population of, of freaks like me who like to look at these things. And the market is extremely inefficient in terms of understanding, you know, how to look at them and how to value them. And, and, to be sure, they, they are options, but they're, they're, they're stock options, they're equity options on a project that don't have an expiration unless the project turns out to be a dud. So, you know, that, that's kind of the trick is to try and, and figure out which projects are going to be duds and which ones aren't. And, you know, I get it wrong occasionally, but um, this, this particular one, and another thing that, that, you know, people I think are, get put off when they, you know, when you talk to them about Cabral is it's in Brazil because they think, uh oh, South America, political mm -hmm. risk. Well, Brazil is one of the, actually probably one of the better jurisdictions for, for, for mining in the world. And I mean, Cabral already has what they call a trial mine permit permit. And that's what they're working on building. And, um, you know, the market just doesn't, doesn't understand that they don't, they don't see that. So the, you know, the, the, the junior project development stocks that have valid projects and have good sources of financing and are run by experienced and accomplished CEOs and, and geologists, they're wildly undervalued relative to their potential upside. And again, you know, they're, they're just until they actually get a mine built and operating, there's still options because there's risk at every point of the way from you know, exploration risk, permitting risk, financing risk. Um, you know, you, you gotta you gotta be meticulous about. You know, there's construction risk, execution risk of of constructing the mine and getting it up and running. So, and, until it's actually producing, it's a stock option. But they're extremely undervalued stock options if you find find ones with worthy projects. And that's what I like about it. Well, Dave, I think that's one of the things you distill. Um, what is a very specialist area, which I, I mean, I wouldn't have any clue as to where to start with that. I mean, because, again, that's a really complex subject that it's like. So and I think um, so people I think, honestly, I would honestly strongly suggest because obviously gold is moving higher. It, it, there's all of, there's every reason and we've discovered discussed multiple um, inputs for, for gold to rise higher. There's not a single bank out there that doesn't think it's going to go higher and isn't long gold. So the, obviously, if you're looking for some leverage, I mean, my goodness me. I mean, the, 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 the mining, the miners are so undervalued. I know this is the point. It must, must frustrate the hell out of you that people don't see it. You know, I, in some ways, I don't mind because it just allows more opportunity to accumulate positions before the general market starts to understand it or starts to turn to it. Um, so, and and I mean, the the mining stocks and including the large cap mining stocks are about as cheap relative to the S and P five hundred as they've been. They're not quite as cheap as they were in two thousand two thousand one. Hmm. But they're they're almost back to that level, and in my opinion, it, it's it's probably one of the only 
what would be considered a traditional value sector in the stock market. So if people want to access that um, newsletter, um, it, it, it's what, the Mining Journal. Is it the Mining Journal? Mining Stock Journal. Mining Stock Journal. Um, they, can, they can access that through your website. Yeah, investmentresearchdynamics.com. Yeah, and I think, we, I mean, it's a no-brainer to me. And again, Dave, I know that you you should up that price. You should. <laughs> <laughs> and, and especially, especially some of, you know, that's an awful lot of work, a lot of distilling of information, knowledge, uh, and, and someone could just parachute in, uh, take the distill, distillation of all that experience and how, I mean, otherwise you'd be looking at hundreds, hundreds of names out there and you'd have to do the research on the, you have to go through and you've done it or you're doing it. And, and so how much, how much is it again? <laughs> it's 20 a month. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to make you say that because <laughs> it's silly, really. Fine, I'm <laughs> going to raise my prices. <laughs> you do. I, I think you, if it was 200 a month, you you'd probably get more subscribers. That's on it probably right. Well because it's just ridiculously cheap. But, but Dave, you're just a wealth of information. I know you do a lot of work for us at Kinesis as well. And I thank you so much for that, um, bringing your knowledge to a very large base of people who, all of who are passionate about gold, silver, et cetera. But, but thank you for joining us today and, and spending a bit of time. We must do this more often, Dave. Um, I, there's only a fraction of what I wanted to, to go over with you here, but it's just a wealth of knowledge. Thank you for joining us and, um, and perhaps join us very, very soon again. Hey, thanks for having me on again. I, I really appreciate it. I, I learn something from you every time we have these conversations. So, um, and it's, it's just enjoyable to, to, you know, shoot the breeze with you about the sector that we're, we're passionate about. And it'll enjoy a few beers when I come over. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, bless you, mate. Bless you. Thank you, Andrew McGuire and our featured guest, Dave Kranzler, for another fascinating discussion. And remember to our entire Live from the Vault community, buy physical, buy physical, make sure it's backed one-to-one -one and understand the difference between what Andy calls the casino gold and silver markets and the actual physical gold and silver markets they're not the same and don't be fooled. So there you have it. That's all we have for you today on another episode of Live from the Vault. And please help keep spreading the word about this channel by hitting that like button, share this information and make sure you're subscribed. And if you want to click on that bell right there, we will notify you as each episode goes live. And with that, we'll see you next time right here on Live from the Vault. See you then.